So I'm going to try to shove what has been a, a burgeoning field in the last few years into the next 35 minutes, if I can, to give you an idea of some of the things that people have been working on and some of the open problems. Um, and maybe it will inspire some of the things that you're thinking about now. Um, so we've already had a couple people talk about what the critical zone is, but since I'm about to spend 35 minutes talking about it, I feel like I should define it one more time. And the idea is that it's a, it's a funny name, right? I'm sure that someone who works on mantle convection likes to think that that's the critical part of the Earth too, right? But the idea is that it's the part of the Earth that we as humans interface with. It is the part where we pull water out and it is the part where we put our waste back in. And it ostensibly goes from atmospheric boundary layer down to the base of groundwater. But what makes the critical zone different, or the idea of critical zone science and why it was supposed to be different, was that it got people from dis different disciplines talking. That you would have a plant physiologist working with a geomorphologist and an atmospheric scientist to start thinking about coupled processes in ways that are very hard to do in singular lead disciplinary ways. And um, so I, the way I decided to outline this talk when I was thinking about how to do this was there's a really nice white paper that came out last year that Pam Sullivan led. You can Google it and download it. It's called New Opportunities for Critical Zone Science. It came out late last year. Um, Daniela Rempe and uh, Jenny Druhan, who came in last night, were contributors to this. And in it, they outline sort of where critical, science, uh, critical zone science has been over the last 15 years or so that it's been a name um, and where they think it should go. And a large number of people in the community contributed to that. And so some of the big points I've, I've sort of made them small for a bullet form were things like how water and energy get into the subsurface. How does rock turn into soil? What role, uh, what role does vegetation have in that? What's the role um, of terrestrial carbon on this planet? And how do critical zone services change with disturbance? And so I'm going to frame this talk specifically around geophysics, but with these topics in mind. And the way I think of geophysics is as a macroscope into the Earth, as a way for us to look at what's in a place where we don't have data. At worst, it is a way to interpolate between points that we have that we've done in soil pits or boreholes. But at best, it may give us a way to test hypotheses by giving us data over a much broader realm than we would normally have data. And here's an example um, of two uh, seismic uh, refraction tomograms that were made from the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory, not too far from where I live now, near Denver, Colorado, in the western U.S. And uh, what's interesting about it is the data set on the right-hand side was part of the master's work of Kevin Beefus. And uh, one of the things he noticed in the seismic refraction data is that the depth of broken up rock, the depth of regolith in the north-facing slopes was deeper than what he saw on his south-facing slope data. And uh, there are hypotheses as to why this might be that the pole-facing slope, so in the northern hemisphere, the north-facing slope, would be colder, goes through more freeze-thaw cycles, and consequently there's more action, more work being done on that, that hill slope in order to break up rock and make it into soil. And so is that what Kevin Beefus sees? Interestingly enough, um, we collected data in another part of the same watershed and saw something quite different, right? We actually didn't see that deeper north-facing piece, and the argument made for this paper that uh, James St. Clair led was that the weathering in this watershed was driven by regional stress. So whether an aquifer was being uh, pulled or pushed and how that opened fractures and how water got in. And so what's cool about this is that geophysics was a way for us to start thinking about these processes in a really large scale that we wouldn't have been able to do with just borehole data potentially. So uh, back in 2015, a group of us were asked to talk about you know, a, a, you know, where geophysics has been in terms of critical zone science. And, we wrote this paper, although while writing it, we all said it, we felt like we were right at the watershed moment where things were getting real for critical zone geophysics. There wasn't that much published in 2015. And so while we wrote this paper and um, outlined what had been done to date and where we thought people could go, I wanna spend this talk mostly thinking about what's happened since 2015, um, because there's been a ton of research and it's, it was really hard to choose what to show you. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you a small piece, but hopefully I can give you a view of what people have been doing in the last few years. If you talk to a critical zone scientist, as geophysicists, geophysicists tend to think about geophysics in a very geophysics-y kind of way, and we ask questions. Is there a question? Uh, Tomas? Oh, no, no. Sorry, I thought. <laughs> Sorry. And, you know, we think about things in a sort of a geophysics-y way, like we have a, a, a hammer and what nail can we hit? Um, but what are the questions that critical zone scientists want to know? And if you talk to people that are geochemists or geobiologists, They'll tell you that what would be awesome would be to have macroscopic 
distributions of a whole variety of parameters, some of which we may not be able to measure with geophysics, but maybe smart people could figure out ways to make links. Um, but things like porosity, which we're very good at, bulk density, could we get some sense of chemical or mineralogical composition over the large scale? Mineral surface area would be huge if there was a way to measure that. Certainly things like root distributions, subsurface, I put connectivity in quotes because there's so many ways to define that. Um, but there's lots of things that people within the critical zone community would like that geophysics may be able to help answer. So I'm gonna hit these. I only have 35 minutes, so I'll try to get through all five. And if I get there, I do. And if I don't, I'll stop somewhere in the middle and we can talk about it after. <coughs> all right, so I'm gonna start with uh, delivery of water into the subsurface. And uh, Sandra Huisman's gonna talk more about this this afternoon, so I'm not gonna give you, um, this will be an equation-free talk. Um, I'm just gonna talk about um, what people have, have done in the field. Now the reason we care about water getting into the subsurface and where it moves, both from an infiltration perspective and a groundwater perspective, is because it controls a lot of ecosystem services we care about. Crop production, water supply, uh, water quality, both in surface water and groundwater, regulation of climate, and regulation of floods, um, soil retention, all of these things are dependent on the way water moves. And so that's part of the reason we care. From a geophysics perspective, it's a pretty easy target too, especially in the unsaturated zone where we see big changes in geophysical properties. So I wanted to start with this because we've been imaging tracers for a really long time in geophysics. We're very good at putting water into the ground and imaging where it goes, or putting salt into the ground and imaging where it goes. Um, this is a paper that came out just a couple years ago. Actually, Andy Binley is a co-author on this. And um, I thought this was a particularly interesting paper because they were looking at a fertilizer injection. So these couple of red lines up here are where they were injecting um, fertilizer into the subsurface. And what they were looking at in part was nitrate production. So what I thought was cool about this, this paper is that they were actually looking at a, a reaction there and the conductivity created by that. And so one of the things that I thought would be really cool is thinking about geophysics and being able to measure things that are conductivity producing or conductivity consuming. The latter might be hard to parse from dispersion, but that if we look at reactions and actually can say something about that, that would be incredibly cool. This is, the electrical conductivity. This is electrical conductivity and the change through time. Thank you for pointing that out. And actually, it's in the unsaturated zone, so that's also an important point. They um, took up some time to parse uh, the, the changes in nitrate production from the changes in moisture content in these data. Um, but down here in the little plots at the bottom, what you see are nitrate and, and bromide um, that are coming through these systems. And you can see the sort of semi-conservative, mostly Gaussian um, behavior that you would expect for a bromide tracer, and then those long tails that you see on nitrate. Nicholas spoke a lot about rock physics relationships and that last presentation is also a good example or that last slide of, of being careful about the way we think about data. So I think a long-standing problem we also have in geophysics is promising more than we can deliver in terms of um, giving up people quantitative or even qualitative estimates of parameters of interest. And um, this was a, a data set out of Western Germany. In fact, Sandra Huisman is an author on this. And um, what this is, is it's a map of electromagnetic induction. So it's a map of, um, bulk uh, conductivity in the earth that people would love to use to measure or say something about water content. But the problem is, is that conductivity is sensitive to a lot of things, right? It's sensitive to moisture content and salinity and temperature and lithologic change. Um, and so what they've done here is they took a very um, comprehensive subsurface data set and tried to figure out what could they parse as water content from these data versus electrical conductivity, versus actually just the porosity variability within the watershed. And so you don't often see people being able to, um, to do that, but if we're trying to make quantitative estimates of parameters of interest, I think that this is a really important thing, um, is for us to figure out how to ground truth the data that we have. Um, the other example I wanted to show is out of the group in Wyoming. Um, and so another option when we don't have great rock physics relationships is potentially to think about multiple methods um, in terms of bringing them together. And so what these guys wanted to know was how uh, water moved through a hill slope and how it varied seasonally. And so what they did is they collected seismic and electrical resistivity data, one time slice is shown on the slide, um, through uh, an entire growing season. And uh, what they wanted to know was not only what did the Earth look like, which we might be able to get like uh, some information from seismic on that, but how did that moisture variability, which you could in part get through ER, um, how did those two things come together to tell them about the subsurface? And so what they were able to do was both interpret the um, combined data, and in this case they parsed out what they thought was unweathered bedrock from a weathered bedrock layer that was both dry and wet, and then this thing that they called mobile regolith. Regolith is a super confusing word within the critical zone community, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but whether that was dry or wet, 
And what they did is by looking uh, at this through time, they were able to parse where the water was going and found that the big controls on flow on this hill slope, at least, um, were related to deep groundwater flow and tree water use, that interflow and runoff weren't a particularly big deal in this watershed. So what's cool about this is that they use the geophysics um, as a way to help constrain our understanding of hydrologic process. Um, Here's an example just from a different part of the Earth that I thought would be worth sharing. This is Emily Wojtek's work, who's uh, here in the audience, um, on the northern slope of Alaska. And so what you're looking at here is a water track. A water track is a super interesting feature in the Arctic. It is sort of like a zeroth order stream. It's like a stream that doesn't have a cut bank um, and has a bunch of vegetation in it. And so what you see is a color change across this very low gradient hill slope. Um, as a function of the fact that it is wetter in this particular area. And there's a bunch of interesting questions um, in the Arctic landscape about biogeochemical cycling and what role water tracks might play and how water moves on this, on this hill slope or on these hill slopes because they're pervasive in these areas. And so um, what Emily had done for part of her PhD is um, she took a look again at a couple of methods trying to parse parameters and processes. Um, on the left-hand side, what I'm showing you is a series of transects of electrical conductivity, resistivity, um, going down the hill slope. And um, it's a permafrost-constrained uh, landscape. So one of the things you see is that it's um, icy where it's red. And so you see permafrost. And then you see this whole area of permafrost thaw that goes down where that water track is. Now, one of the things that was super cool about this data set is that the classic way of, of mapping permafrost distribution is with a, a frost probe. Basically, you and a piece of rebar knocking it into the ground until it goes thunk, right? And so all of these black Xs are a piece of rebar hitting what we think is permafrost. But what's really interesting is, particularly under the water track, the difference between what we measured from the, fro the frost probe and what we see in the geophysics. And so what's interesting about this is that whatever we're hitting is solid enough to be frozen, but potentially partially thawed thought enough that maybe there's actually water moving through this area and that there could be um, implications for the biogeochemistry of, the, of this system. Um, on the right-hand side, what you're seeing is an image of uh, self-potential measurements, with, which um, Nicholas talked about earlier. And uh, in black, what you have is sort of a watershed boundary um, that was uh, parsed out by terrestrial LIDAR because the changes in topography are so, so tiny um, at these hill slopes. And, um, and what she's done is tried to interpret flow in the context of some other data um, in that subsurface and sees things moving towards that, that water track, and the idea was to take a look at this through time. But what's neat about these sorts of data is that we can start to get a bigger picture of what's happening in the subsurface in terms of flow, both in saturated and unsaturated systems that might be coupled to things like biogeochemistry. So in terms of this like, first piece, in terms of this flow pathway piece, I think what's cool about this is it gives us a way to test different hydrologic processes, geochemical processes over a larger scale when constrained by additional data. Um, and we can look at things and how they change through time. For some of the instrumentation, particularly electrical uh, conductivity methods, you can set up electrodes and leave them in place for long periods of time. And a, a key piece, and I'm sure this will come back in the next couple of talks too, is just how do we get from parameters that we measure, seismic velocity, dielectric permittivity, electrical conductivity, to something that matters to someone else who's thinking about other, other different processes. Um, and I think all of these things are, are are still open to think about. Um, OK, so the second bullet point that was in that white paper was talking about transformation of rock into soil. And um, the idea is, is, is bedrock goes through the, you know, the process of being weathered. It eventually makes its way to soil. There is sort of a, a language issue here on regolith and saprolite that I'll mention just because it's been a, a point of discussion within the geophysical community or within the critical zone community. In this context, at least, regolith is broken up rock. It is what we are geophysically um, sensitive to, and the fact that something is busted up um, will change its P-wave velocity, you know, potentially its conductivity, et cetera. Saprolite usually means that it's been geochemically weathered or altered, and it's pretty hard for us to parse the difference between those two with geophysics. So what we measure is often just busted up rock. Um, if there was a way to tell what was geochemically altered versus what is physically altered, and I'll come back to that in a moment, that would be incredibly cool. Um, but at the moment, for the most part, we just measure stuff that's, that's broken up. Um, and so part of the reason people care about weathering is because this helps us figure out what areas are prone to landslides. It's how we get soil so that we can grow agricultural materials. Just from a landscape evolution perspective, um, we get senses of timing um, that are all important in that, in that weathering process. And also from a geophysical point of view, it's a pretty good target. In general, we can, we can see that, that boundary. So uh, here's a data set from Jordan Hayes. Um, 
I should have pointed out when I started that there are three early career faculty members that contributed some data to me, which was super nice. So you guys could see some things that weren't published, that weren't just out of my group. Um, so what Jordan had done is in a, a watershed near Laramie, Wyoming, um, she collected a bunch of seismic um, tomography or refraction tomography data that she's showing here. And one of the things that she noticed was that um, when she looked under her valleys, things were a lot more broken up. There seemed to be deeper regolith than there was under her, that would be a ridge, under the ridge as opposed to the valleys. So when, when she was under the valleys, she saw a bit more intact rock. So one of the questions she was interested in was how landscape, um, how weathering changed over a landscape scale. And so she had a series of borehole data in which she looked at an optical televiewer and actually counted up the number of fractures she saw in these, these differing areas, and that's what's on this right-hand side. And um, what you can see here is that under the valley, um, she generally saw less fracturing, a lower fracture density than she did under the ridge, which is all this plot is right here. And so she was able to um, build a relationship, which is what's shown at the bottom, uh, between uh, fracture density and seismic velocity in this case. So if um, you were interested in sort of the development of, of regolith over this landscape, uh, these data would potentially be helpful to you. Um, we've taken data like this, um, but thought about the anisotropy piece of it. So here's a data set from not too far from where Jordan was working. Um, Please. Why the hell should there be less weathering in the valley than under the ridge? Well, I would expect more or less the opposite. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's out there in the literature right now talks about um, stress and strain on a watershed, depending on its regional stress. And so the compressive stresses of aquifers as, as driven by their topography can potentially lead to inverse relationships between um, weathering and the shape of that watershed. So depending, there's a whole variety of seismic, so this is what's kind of cool, there's a whole bunch of seismic data that's been coming out that shows more weathering in the valleys as you might sort of expect, it's what I would have expected, um, and ones that show the inverse of that. Now whether or not that's related to regional stress depends a little bit on how well you can measure the regional stress, um, but there does seem to be a correlation and that's part of what that science paper that um, James St. Clair put out was actually looking at, was data like this that didn't necessarily fit what one might have thought. So, but they chalked it up to regional stress, whether that's the case or not, I think is an open question, but please, Danny. Well, you mentioned the same thing in the early, in those slides that you showed earlier. Yeah. The north facing, south facing slides will have a huge difference in the water balance. Yeah. So, can you speak uh, louder? Yeah, I can repeat the question. He uh, is saying that there's also a big difference in water balance between the north facing and the south facing slopes also. So, so, the, so if I associate weathering to those depths with the vegetation, for example, I find that it, yeah, it's, well, I think it's hard to parse the process. And this is part of what's cool, sort of cool about the critical zone idea, right? Because you've got differences in solar insulation. You have differences in vegetation on those hill slopes. And there's a chicken egg issue here with water, right? Um, there's differences potentially in freeze thaw behavior. And so I think there's a whole bunch of coupled processes that depending on the watershed you're in could be the controlling variable. Um, I mean, I'm wondering, I put the vegetation way, way top, uh, over, uh, wet, over uh, freeze thaw by more than magnitude. Yeah, well, you know, I think there's some really interesting questions that are out there in the community, too, and you may have answers to these, but I don't, um, in terms of, like, root exudates. So when you have, you know, the chemistry of, of roots, I think, is a really interesting problem within um, these problems, too. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, th I think it's cool that you think that, and yes. hopefully data will play that out. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, that's the whole idea of hypothesizing about a thing, right? So, um, okay, so please interrupt any time. Um, so here's some additional data looking at seismic anisotropy rather than just seismics. Because what we were thinking about, if you're thinking about fracturing, if fracturing is a big deal, then anisotropy would potentially be a big deal too. And so we have some data from these opposite slopes. And uh, when we look really shallowly, mostly in the soils, what we see is it's not terribly anisotropic, which you'd probably expect. When something's busted up enough, the difference in seismic velocity with direction doesn't matter that much. And so we see something really similar um, on these two hill slopes. But if we take a look at the data that we collected um, with longer lines, uh, some of this is circle shoots and some of this is giant asterisks. Um, what we saw in those data is that in general on the south facing slopes, we were seeing more anisotropy than we were seeing on the north facing slopes. Now one of the things that's a little tricky about critical, science, uh, critical zone science, it comes back to Danny's point I think, is that there are many tens of sites um, on the planet right now that identify themselves as critical zone observatories and many more where people have been doing this work without using that title for a long time. Um, but one of the things that's hard, I think, and a, a big picture idea to think about is um, reevaluating some of these data or collecting similar data over multiple watersheds so that we're not just, 
um, thinking about a single system. But um, anyway, so we see higher anisotropy on the south facing slopes. We also have boreholes. We drilled a whole bunch on a hill slope with a um, portable rig, well, as many as we could drill. And what we do see is similar fracture orientation on these two, um, on these two hill slopes. In this case, there's only sort of one, this dark black line is statistically significant. Um, groupings, uh, and we only see one on the north facing slope versus two on the south facing slope, but we have a whole dearth of wells. We have all of two wells on the north facing slope that we're constraining this particular data set. Um, and you can kind of see a similar pattern maybe that would have evolved if we'd had more data, who knows. Um, but what's interesting about this is we see the same orientation of fracturing regardless of which side you are on the watershed. And what's cool about this particular watershed is that it's mostly in a nice. And so a lot of that fracturing is happening along foliation. And so you see the same uh, orientation of, of foliation of that gneiss and of fracturing on both the north and south facing slopes. Here is another seismic refraction tomogram from that exact same site that we were working at. And now what I've, I've uh, superimposed on this tomogram is the anisotropy that we're seeing on the south facing slopes in a variety of areas versus the anisotropy we're seeing in the north facing slope and then down the other side. Um, and in general, what we're seeing is a lot more anisotropy on the south facing slope. So even though maybe that difference in depth between the north and south facing slopes isn't that clear in this particular watershed, what is cool is that the anisotropy is different. And why would that be? Well, if we take a look at the way these fractures are dipping, what's kind of cool about is going to get into that system is going to look really different on this side of the watershed than on this one in terms of the fact that stuff's going to get in here and potentially open those fractures up as opposed to be shunted down. Um, the fractures on the, on the opposite side. So does that control this, the anisotropy? Does that control the weathering um, that we see, the, the differences in weathering in these two sites? Um, I think it's, a, it's still an open question for us, but what we think we're seeing. Sorry, excuse me. Oh, please. Uh, but in this case, what would, what's the hypothesis between the orientation of the foliation? Um, we see the same orientation in foliation on, the, on both hill slopes, so it looks exactly the same. This is like the two-dimensional version of that, sort of. Uh, it's, it's controlled by the nice. So the nice foli the foliation of that particular nice, the when it was put in place. Yeah, yeah. Is it a nice? Is it a nice? This is a nice, but is it foliated? Yes, yes, yeah. So this is in a, a foliated nice is what this is. Um, most of this watershed is granite, but we're in the section that happened. We didn't mean to end up in that section, but... Um, Okay, so coming to these questions of both physical and chemical um, weathering. So um, this is another da data set from Jordan Hayes. So she was in the Southern Sierra Critical Zone Observatory in California. And she was trying to parse this idea of physical heterogeneity versus chemical heterogeneity and, and or physical and chemical weathering, maybe more than heterogeneity. And um, what she has up top here is a, is a data set. She has this thing that she was calling bulk tau. So if you talk to any geochemists, they love this, this parameter tau. They'll talk about tau all the time. And tau goes from minus one to plus one. And what it usually is, is the, a measure of an element with respect to, to that element when it has not yet been weathered. So the idea is, is if you see negative values, you can see that something is depleted from the geochemical profile. And if you see values greater than zero, then it is, um, it's potentially been put in place, maybe from atmospheric deposition or something like that. So, um, so geochemists really love the idea of tau. It's usually re with respect to a single element that's um, not supposed to be doing too much otherwise besides being weathered out. Um, Jordan, for her work here, actually lumped all of the sort of major elements that she had in her data set into one thing that she's calling bulk tau. Um, so in it is iron and manganese and a bunch of other silica. I think I can't even remember what all's in here. Um, but what you see is a sort of a constant dep depletion profile that's small through the entire depth of the boreholes that she has down to 12 meters. So um, what's interesting, though, is that when she takes a look at porosity down that same borehole, um, she sees a sort of a trajectory that looks different than what they see in that bulk tau. And in fact, it looks a little bit more like this volumetric strain profile that they have. And so what they did is they collected some refraction data over a larger um, area to try to parse whether or not you could say that part of this was physical versus chemical weathering. And again, this is a single case study, so take it for what it is. But in this particular case, the mass loss that she was seeing in the porosity really couldn't be explained by that geochemical piece that she attributed about 20, 20 some percent of the porosity um, at the site um, to chemical weathering and then the rest of it 
to um, physical weathering. And so what you have in the colored images on the right-hand side, the top you have a seismic refraction tomogram again. Um, so you're looking at changes in velocity, so variations in how busted up your rock is. Beneath that, she's converted that to porosity through relationships that hopefully make sense for that particular site. Um, but then if you know something about porosity, you might be able to say something loosely about strain within a watershed. And so another way to get, potentially get at localized strain. Um, and so the idea, what was cool about this work, it's still in review at Science Advances, so we'll see where it ends up. But what's neat about it is they're trying to parse that physical from that chemical piece. Um, and that geophysics may have a role to help extrapolate beyond what we would otherwise have at the single borehole or single boreholes scale. Um, okay, so I think there's lots of open questions about chemical and physical weathering and how we could potentially parse those and where geophysics might be able to play a role. I think there's a gazillion things that go into weathering. So from stress to freeze thaw to heterogeneity to trees, um, trees has an exclamation point on it because I'm just about to go there, um, that I think are really cool and open questions within the critical zone community. All right, let's uh, run three, we're killing it. So um, let's talk about vegetation and hydrology. So um, geophysics, mostly we've used geophysics around plant systems to think about changes in moisture content. That's a, that's a fairly obvious one, but I think there's a lot of interesting and open questions around biogeochemical changes associated with plants too. Coming back to root exudates and other things, I don't know that we can measure it, it might be too small, but um, I think there's some interesting and open questions about plants. Um, here's a paper that came out of Poland just this year that was kind of an interesting one. Um, the short version of what I took away from it is that tree roots add complexity to the subsurface, which is not a thing that I needed geophysics for. But, um, but it is what's kind of interesting about this paper is that when they looked underneath live trees, which is on the left-hand side, there was a whole lot more going on than underneath dead trees. And so that was the big takeaway for me um, under this particular system. But can we start to see something about or say something about what trees are doing in the subsurface um, by having more comprehensive data than single point measurement. One of the things that's really hard about trees or plants in general is that roots are really heterogeneous and complex and where do you make a measurement? And so is a large macroscopic measure of something uh, potentially of value in terms of tying those together. Um, this is an old paper, so I'm, I'm flipping back in time 10 years, but I like it so much that I'm gonna bring it back. And it's um, work from a group at Michigan State where they were looking at changes in moisture across a really sharp ecotone. So they were looking across a forested landscape that went into a grassland. They call this volumetric moisture, but it's really just a map of conductivity that's been converted through a, a rock physics relationship. And, um, and what you see is that early in the growing season, it is drier, deeper underneath trees than it is under a grassland, which is not super surprising. Um, but it's cool to be able to see it so clearly. And when they come back in August, they just see that that's even more the case. And so what was cool about this paper was that they used it to parameterize roots in a uh, regional scale hydrologic model. And that's a thing that we struggle with is how to parameterize a root. And so at least they had some sense of functional root depth while maybe not actual root depth, which is probably what we care about most anyway. Mm -hmm. um, other people have looked at this in a process-based perspective. This is work um, out of Rutgers where uh, they were actually imaging the process of hydraulic redistribution. So this is a kind of a cool process. Trees do super cool things. So when we think about how trees transpire, you need to have a, a potential gradient, right, for flow to move. So the potential at the roots has to be higher than the potential in the trunk, has to be higher than the potential in the leaves in order for a tree to transpire. But in their roots, they actually do some really interesting things in terms of moving water laterally. Um, and part of this, or even down at times, um, to protect their root mass, to keep things wet so that they can potentially optimize nutrient uptake. Maybe they're hiding water, even from an evaporation perspective. Um, but what this group was actually doing, all these little um, black dots are trees and all the little white dots are soil borings um, that they were using for um, grain size distribution. Um, but they took a look at how this tree was actually uh, taking water up and releasing it during the day. We've done something similar um, over the last couple of years, coupling the subsurface piece, which is sh what's shown here. These are uh, cross sections. Um, sorry, map view. That would make more sense. Uh, map view images um, to what's actually happening in the tree. One of the things that we've been interested in is how does the timing change between the diel cycles, the daily cycles that we see in things like sap flow within a tree to um, stream stage to water table variability and to the electrical conductivity of the soil as a proxy for a whole bunch of things, but in part soil moisture. And uh, this is work of Ryan Harmon for his PhD. Um, so if we think about trees being the primary driver of um, how water moves in a system, what we would find in some of these data, this is from Oregon, um, so from a very wet sort of Mediterranean climate, is that early in the growing season, say in May, that 
the peak in sap flow would be matched by a minima in electrical conductivity about three hours later. Another hour after that, we'd see a minima in the water table data. And 30 or so minutes after that, we'd see a change in stream discharge, a minima also. Um, and what's interesting is that we come back later in the growing season, say September, is that those patterns have changed. And so what's nice about these geophysical data, this one opens up some crazy questions for me, actually, because what we see is that the trees, um, after they turn on in the late growing season, the first thing to respond is actually the water table. So this could give us some answers about where trees are pulling water from at what time these trees are pulling water from at a particular time of year, um, followed by the stream. But check it out, the conductivity is like way, way late, like way later than I would have thought. And um, here's my only hypothesis at the moment. But um, part of this might be that the water table is deep enough that this electrical conductivity, this is all surface-based, is mostly sensitive to the Vedo zone. And are we actually seeing something related to the bottom boundary condition changing as that water table pulls down um, we're actually seeing changes in moisture in the system that show up way later. Um, so a good way to answer this question though, right, is through a model. And so um, this is also work of Emily Wojtek, um, looking at trying to couple trees to um, subsurface systems. And I think there's a ton of questions about how we do this. This is a, a small scale system, but how we start to couple plant physiology in meaningful ways to groundwater hydrology. Um, please, oh, five minutes, four minutes, awesome. Um, so I think there's some interesting questions. There's some SP data here that I'm sure Emily would love to talk to you guys about too, thinking about tree water use and self-potential. Um, okay, so I think there's a thousand things around plants. I'm super psyched on plants right now. I just think they're really cool. Um, but there's, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that what the geophysical signature is of root behavior are and associated fungi. I mean, there are crazy things with fungi, right? Um, how species dependent are the results, I think is a, a really cool and open question. I mean, I, all I've learned about trees in the last few years of thinking about trees is that every tree acts differently than the tree next to it, um, both dependent on species, but on age and all sorts of cool things. Um, I don't know how we model this stuff well. I've talked to a lot of uh, tr tree physiologists over the last few years, and they're really good at, at modeling trees. Um, but that, that coupled piece, especially over really big scales, um, and how to do that in a way that sort of captures the meaningful physics, I think is still an open and interesting area. Um, lots of people talk about the wood wide web. In fact, there was an article in the BBC this morning talking about how trees communicate with one another. And so like, how, you know, how do, how do they do that? And so uh, some of that's gotta be probably some subsurface surface piece in part. I doubt we can measure that, but maybe we could and it'd be awesome. Um, okay, and then, um, right. All right, so I've got four minutes. I'm gonna just say that carbon is important. <laughs> um, and it would be really cool if we could image gases and uh, structural constraints. And I have a couple of examples, an old data from Andy Parsiki, and I'm happy to talk about this afterwards, actually imaging uh, gas formation in the subsurface methane carbon dioxide, mostly underneath forested areas, not so much in fens, pretty cool. Um, a new paper that um, Chavi Comas put out last year, actually estimating the carbon stocks and wetlands uh, down in the Everglades, which is super interesting. And he's also been looking at, um, thinking of the disturbance piece, fire, and how we see differences in carbon. Um, this is from Indonesia um, as a function of fire and what role geophysics might have in trying to estimate changes in peat that might allow us to get at changes in carbon. Um, we know that we can image things like um, carbon sequestration. People have been working on that problem for a long time. What I think is cool about some of these examples is they're part of the natural system. Um, so I think there's a lot of questions about carbon and what role geophysics might be able to play in terms of carbon cycle status, dynamics, evolution, carbon fate, um, reactivity of the subsurface, all of these things would be really cool. Um, and good, good questions for people to think about and whether or not any of the methods that you have or could develop could potentially answer any of them. Okay, so um, that's that. So basically this talk was a sort of a whiplash um, version of a bunch of things that have come out in the last couple of years that I think are really cool. But what is important, I hope, is that um, in the work that you guys are doing now, I know there's a lot of people doing really cool things with geophysics. I think there's a lot of big problems out there um, that require smart people to think about them and develop new methods and new ways to use old methods so that we can help answer some of the questions that are um, still open in the critical zone community um, and how we can use these data quantitatively or you know, even qualitatively at times to say something about change. Um, I think that geophysical methods are super useful for testing conceptual models. Um, that we can ask questions about how the system works and interpolate over lots of point measurements that we may already have to try to get a bigger picture of the system. 
And there's lots of things geometry related that um, sometimes geophysicists don't think are that interesting because we've been able to image de depth of bedrock for decades, but it turns out is actually really useful in terms of being the bottom boundary condition on a hydrologic model. Um, so thinking about that, I think has value. And certainly there's a lot of needs. The whole idea of critical zone science is being able to think across or collaborate across interdisciplinary boundaries. Um, and it's super hard, right? Because we're, we're, we're separated by language. In many, in many cases, and um, but, you know, the first time I saw an image of tree xylem, the active part of a tree where transpiration happens, it's two different species. One of them looked just like porous media, and the other one looked just like a fractured rock system, and the equations they use are the same equations that we use when we think about transport in the subsurface. There's a ton of overlap, and so I do think that there's, um, there's a lot of potential in systems like this to work with people that are outside of the box. Who is doing all the uh, great talk? I love that. Um, who is doing all the integrating over the various sites? Because you talk about all these critical zone sites, and uh, there are various sensitivities of processes in various sites. I mean, there are geomechanical, geological, biogeochemistry, bio, etc. Who, who is looking at? Okay, let's all put this together and, and start to understand now actually the processes rather than say we're going on one site where I have dominantly a fractured rock. Uh, yeah, um, I can speak to that best for the, the American perspective, um, just because there's been a network of critical zone observatories, 10 of them, um, that have been sort of up and running since the early 2000s. So um, to be honest, I think almost all of the critical zone observatories that exist started on their own, um, either because there was or was not something interesting about that site. Someone maybe have had a whole bunch of data from, you know, back in the day and they started collecting new data or there were interesting questions about a particular site. And only after the fact, decade in, at, in the US, did we start um, thinking about how to integrate those, you know, those systems. And it's been, it's been a struggle, to be honest. And part of the reason it's a struggle is for exactly the reason you said, um, which is that the processes we're thinking about aren't always the same. Part of that is the geologic truth of a watershed, what is interesting there, but also the expertise of the people that happen to be working there. So we don't even have common measurements at some of the sites. We try to have things like, stream discharge or um, you know, basic chemistry um, at all of these, these watersheds, at least in the US. But the idea is to um, have people making big integrated models. And I know that some people are gonna be talking on that next week. Um, and, but I, I mean, I think this is a, a work in progress and there is open space for people to think about data reevaluation over those sites, looking at common data sets. Because I think right now we've collected a lot of data. Um, it's all on the web. It's all supposed to be available as part of the, at least the American Critical Zone Network mandate. Um, so there's a lot of data that people could start looking at that integrated piece, but honest, if I'm totally honest, I don't think we're there yet. Another question? Please. Um, for the seismic anisotropy problem, um, do you know if there's anyone that has used S-wave polarization to find a preferential, preferential orientation for the fractures? Uh, you know, I personally don't know. I'm not as much of a seismic person as a lot of other things. So I'm super good at swinging a sledgehammer and um, that is my <laughs> best seismic skill. So I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure that there are people that have considered this, but I don't know of any publications off the top of my head just because I'm too far out of the literature, unfortunately. But it's an interesting question and worth taking a look at. <laughs>